starts with a man, who starts with a girl, who starts with the Prince of Wales. It was simply grand, he said, talking band, and she said, delightful, sir. Glory, glory, alleluia, I'm the luckiest of females. For I've danced with a man, who starts with a girl, who starts with a Prince of Wales. Thank you. Trouble, Alec. His mind was made up. He was all ready to go, and go quietly. And now this. Encouraging him to think the country would stand by him if it came to a showdown. And that he might, in the end, be able to make a divorced woman queen. The King Edward touch. The royal technique repays study. He went to Wales, resolute to find a remedy. He went to see for himself, etc., etc. My God, just listen to this. Even such deadweight lethargy as surrounds Britain's most vital need, rearmament, would yield to the King Edward touch. In other words, the mail is saying, let's have a king's party in Parliament. Fortunately, the Times has counted very heavily. The king's constitutional position is above and apart from party politics. And all those that cherish the institution of the monarchy will always strive to keep it so. So much for a king's party. Nevertheless, this pernicious piece in the mail has given him enough hope to seek delay. How have you advised him? How have I advised him? Prime Minister, it's Monckton who now advises him. But the fact is that he no longer listens to anything. He doesn't wish to hear, or to anybody, except that woman. As I say, he would have gone quickly, but this... this is a direct encouragement for him to believe in the possibility of a king's party. What exactly does Morgan Attic mean, Mr. Armstrong? Morgan Attic marriage is a marriage where a commoner marries a prince and cannot share his royal rank, nor would their children inherit. What is the position of the commoner? Well, a subordinate title is often arranged outside that of royal rank, and the uh, usual regal comforts are available, and that is love. I'm not sure we should be discussing this matter. It's not the same as becoming royal, you know. But it does have a certain cachet, and it might work as a compromise in this case. I think I like the idea in view of the circumstances. Well, what do you think of it, Walter? There's no provision in our law as it stands today, sir, whereby the Sovereign of England can make a morganatic marriage. Even if the Cabinet approved the idea, a special legislation would be required and the necessary bill wouldn't stand much chance of getting through. Hmm. I'm afraid that Walter's probably right. Well, I still think it's worth a try. At least the idea could be aired, not just stifled at birth. Well, with respect, sir, I'd be reluctant to take it to Downing Street. Well, how about you, Esmond? Yes, Esmond. Well, I'll go to Baldwin. He won't frighten me. Would you consider going tonight? Well, of course, sir. Well, thank you. That's very good of you. Mm -hmm. I'll call Mr. Baldwin now. The people love him. The people want him to have the woman he loves. They don't even know who she is yet. In England, apart from the royal set, hardly anyone knows she exists. Well, thanks to the forbearance of ourselves and other newspaper proprietors. You'll not forbear forever, I dare say. Sooner or later, they'll know all about her, and they won't want her. The Daily Mail thinks otherwise. I know the people of this country better than... better than the Daily Mail. The people of this country will not want that woman for queen. Well, that's the whole point of the present proposals, a morganatic marriage. The woman the king marries becomes the queen. Such a marriage is constitutionally impossible without special legislation, and neither House of Parliament would ever pass it. Surely they would. The whole standard of morals is much more broad-minded since the war. Quite right. Ideals of morality and of duty and self-sacrifice have certainly gone down since the war, but the ideal of kingship has gone up because people want to see decency somewhere. The ideal of kingship, Harmsworth, has never in history stood so high as it stands now, and I tell you, 
The British people will never accept this thing which you suggest. More coffee, David? No, thank you, darling. Of course, you do know, Wallace, that if this morganatic proposal were accepted, your position as my wife would only be altered in a technical sense. You'd still be able to help me in my official capacity. Well, wouldn't there be political advantages as well? After all, we would be unifying the two great English-speaking nations. Exactly. Your own vitality could end with the greatest possible asset. Oh, if only Esmond could get through to Baldwin. Well, there must be a way. Mm. The Attorney General, sir. Thank you. Your advice, please, Sir Donald. The King is entertaining some idea of a morganatic marriage between himself and Mrs. Simpson. What should I say to him about this from the point of view of law? You should say to him, Prime Minister, that in England the wife of the King is Queen. To pass an act to make this not so would be tantamount to declaring that the King desired to marry someone unfit to be his Queen, and therefore, by definition, unfit to be his wife. Thank you, Sir Donald. You need say no more. Goodbye. Before I see His Majesty, I must be quite clear if we had to resign over this issue, what would your attitude be as leader of the opposition? I should certainly refuse to form an alternative government. Thank you. And now, what about you, Winston? Would you support me if I resign? As opposed to doing what, Prime Minister? You and certain others are known to favour the King. I should not indulge in faction, if that is what you mean. This matter is far too serious. I do wish the King well. So do we all. I wish him very well. But if the government resigns, I should support the government. Divine rubies, Wallace, dear. And those stunning Cartier settings and something quite fascinatingly unusual about the cut of the diamonds. The new man has been discovered. Where? In Rome. By Cartier. No, Cartier don't approve of his methods. So whose idea was it to risk letting him loose on such... Very rare stones as these. Let us say mine. Is that enough for your dossier, Chips? <laughs> oh, my two favorite Americans. Sizzle. Darling. But since Chips is a member of your House of Commons, he can hardly still count as American. Oh, very well, then. Wallace, my one favorite American. Oh, I'm afraid that's not true anymore. We both feel more European. Wallace is absolutely <laughs> right. The sad thing about Americans is they like style. And we both like style, don't we, Chips? <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Baldwin. Good morning, sir. Do sit down, won't you? Thank you. Prime Minister, I've asked you to come see me because I've heard nothing from you for five days. Has a suggested proposal for a morganatic marriage been put to you? Yes, sir, it has. And what do you think about it? I have not considered it, sir. I don't understand, Mr. Baldwin. I do not mean that I've ignored it, but I am not in a position to give a considered opinion. I don't mean I haven't thought about it. But I have not considered it officially, which would mean putting it to the Cabinet and to the Dominions as well, sir. But if you want a horseback opinion, I think that Parliament would never pass the necessary legislation. But it has yet to be consulted. Might very well understand how important this lady is to me. Their understanding, sir, is that the lady is twice divorced. But if you wish, I will examine the proposal formally. Yes, please do so, Mr. Paulwin. If you insist, sir. Yes, I do. I do. Very well, sir. Lord Beaverbrook, hmm? I'm Hewitson, King's Messenger. I'm to tell you from His Majesty that you're most welcome back to England and that you're to lunch with him at Fort Belvedere. Oh, that's all fine, but I think I'll lunch at home. 
I have no diet. Oh, His Majesty's chef has telephoned your Lordship's staff at Stornoway House, and luncheon will comprise only such dishes as are admissible. Are you sure they talked about the latest diet? Not the other one, but the one I started on as I was leaving England. Oh, yes, my Lord. Your Lordship's staff at Stornoway House especially contacted the chef on board your liner before supplying final details to His Majesty's chef at Fort Belvedere. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's what I call really thoughtful. Yes, yes, very thoughtful of you, sir. Thank you. Uh, whilst on board ship, I had time to assess the situation. And it seems to me that uh, your popularity in this country, sir, is indestructible. Particularly after your tour of South Wales. Well, I'm glad it was thought to have been successful. Uh, you comforted, restored, inspired. Your people love you. You may marry whom you choose. The government has no right in law or precedent to forbid the bans. But what you must not do, sir, is to propose morganatic marriage. Well, Wallace rather liked the idea, and so did I. It was Harmsworth's suggestion, and he put it up to the PM. Harmsworth? And what did the PM say? That it would need special legislation if it could not be passed. You see, sir, by putting up this proposal, you and Harmsworth have laid your majesty open to every sort of uh, frustration and humiliation at the hands of your ministers. If you just marry, sir, you give the politicians no room for maneuver at all. But if you ask for a morganatic marriage that needs special legislation, you pass the power to the cabinet. Yes, I see. So, uh, here's the cost that I suggest, sir. One, you withdraw the morganatic proposal. Two, you find some friend in the cabinet to represent your case. And three, postpone any decision until we have measured the strength on either side. But whom can we find in the cabinet who would speak for me? Mm, I have in mind Sir Samuel Haw. From the outset, I've had no faith in a morganatic solution, and I told the king so. I agree. I've said as much myself. Well, what was his reaction? Well, he appeared to accept what I'd recommended, but I wasn't entirely sure. I had the feeling that... Uh, his agreement would be based on Mrs. Simpson's approval. She favors it. Hmm. As we are both against this morganatic proposal, will you help me enlist Sam Haw? Well, if this thing is to drag on, I suppose the king must be well represented in the cabinet. What do you mean, drag on? I thought you were the king's friend. Oh, you know I am, Max. But I believe that he should abandon this struggle to retain the throne unless he means to give up, Mrs. Simpson. Oh, he won't give her up. And we must not give him up. Then perhaps we should approach Sam. See if he's our man. Right, Walter. I'll see him tonight. Now, what we need is a strong representative in the cabinet. Do you indeed? Well, I'm afraid you can't have me. Why not, Sam? It's a futile cause. You could nevertheless speak as the king's friend. The cause is discredited, Max. You don't have to say that you approve it. Your role could be that of uh, watching advocate. My role will be that of devil's advocate. Max, I don't want it. I know how you feel, David, that a morganatic marriage is far from perfect, but we've both agreed. It's all that's left to us at the moment. Well, I'm not so sure, Wallace. You deserve better. Under these circumstances, wouldn't it be best? Well, we've got to do something. That's certain. Oh, why hasn't Max telephoned? I don't know, and I'll find out in the morning. Well, why not now? No, oh, what's the time? Oh, it's a bit late to disturb him now. Well, shouldn't he have telephoned before he went to bed? All right, I'll put through call. Foot called Lord B, please. Darling, what I want is whatever will make you happiest. Yes, sir. Yes, I, I have spoken with Sam Haw, but I've been unable to persuade him. Well, I wish I'd known a little earlier, Max. I thought I should sleep on it. Max, I must have Wallace on any terms. That's the truth of it. 
And what are the terms, sir? Well, I very much appreciate the proposals you've made today and the energy with which you've tried to forward them. But I have to say, Max, that the morganatic marriage proposal is still the one we favor. I must tell you, sir, if you pursue this line, you will lose the fight before it's begun. Oh, but it's very late, sir. Perhaps we should both sleep on it. Well, I can't sleep, Max. But of course you must. And you shall. Yes. Good night, Max. In answer to the king's insistence that a morganatic marriage should be considered, I replied that I would first of all need to consult the cabinet and that the Dominion's cabinets would also have to be consulted. The king, of course, could consult the Dominion's governments direct through the governor's general, but I am loath to employ that channel because I consider the matter to be too delicate and too personal to be handled by the king himself. Cables are therefore being prepared and will be dispatched to the Dominions, inviting them to give their views on each of the three following courses. Firstly, that the King should marry Mrs. Simpson and that she should be recognized as Queen. Secondly, that he should marry her and yet that she should not become Queen, the morganatic proposal. And thirdly, that His Majesty should abdicate in favor of His Royal Highness, the Duke of York. Gentlemen, today is November the 27th. Our next regular cabinet meeting is on Wednesday, December the 2nd. Between now and then, I shall receive replies from the Dominions. Between now and then, you must resolve in your minds and in your hearts what is to be done in this unhappy affair. I shall then be in a position, strengthened by your advice and that of the Dominions, to approach His Majesty and tell him the will of his people, both here in Britain and throughout the Empire. He told his mother, he told his brothers, and he told me that if he had to go, he would go quietly. Yet it continues. Ever since Harmsworth came up with this morganatic notion. I know Mrs. Simpson likes the idea. She thinks it would work, and so does the King. Then there's Beaverbrook buzzing about. Is he still taking the same line? Oh, well, he's encouraging the king to hang on. He's against a morganatic marriage because of its legislative complications. But he's for the marriage, which he says the king can make without permission of the politicians. The Rothermere press at the morganatic end, the Beaverbrook press at the just get spliced and damn their eyes in. All of them pro the marriage. And yet, Walter... And yet I'm sure that the press barons do not speak for the people of England. No, I agree. And by the same token, I venture to suggest that the voice of Max Beaverbrook is not necessarily the voice of his native Canada. When do you expect responses to the telegrams you've sent to the Dominion? Not for a day or two. And your own cabinet? The cabinet meets on Wednesday. Chip Storen, thank you for the beautiful flowers. Yes. Well, I'm sorry I had to cancel last night's dinner party, but <clears throat> the doctor says I have to have absolute quiet for several days and avoid all excitement. <laughs> Even the electric telephone, and especially electric visitors like you. Yes, thanks again. Bye, Chips. Aunt Bessie, I'm so bored. I think I'll get up tomorrow and go out. Oh, would that be wise, Wallace? If I don't do something, I'll be driven crazy by this waiting. Well, drink this down. It'll help to calm you. Only for a few hours, I'm afraid. Wallace, when you're feeling a little better, do you think we could leave London for somewhere quieter? Where would that be, Aunt Bessie? These days we carry our own noise along with us. Hang it, Walter. These bloody politicians made Wallace ill. I am sorry to hear that, sir. Yes. And Beaverbrook keeps opposing the Morganatic suggestion when he knows perfectly well it's what Wallace and I both want. 
And when will there be answers from the Dominions? Very soon, sir. Please try to be patient. Well, Beaverbrook says that Baldwin has slanted them to get the answers that he wants. Well, I don't know the precise text, sir, but I'm assured by the permanent secretary at the Dominions office where these cables were prepared that the account given and the choices proposed are scrupulously fair. All right. So if only those wretched answers wouldn't take forever to come. Before the Cabinet meets in two days' time, Mr. Attlee, I once more need to know where the Labour Party stand. Neither mine nor the party's attitude have changed. While the Labour people have no objection to an American becoming Queen, I'm certain they would not approve of Mrs. Simpson for that position. And the Morganatic idea? They'd object to that as well. There are certain sophisticated elements in London who favour it. Important not to think that London is typical of the country as a whole. The Labour Party's ideas are rooted in the provincial decencies, not in metropolitan chick. There is a lot of sympathy for the King on the Labour benches. Despite the sympathy felt for the King and the affection which his visits to the pressed areas have created, the party, with the exception of a few of the intelligentsia who can be trusted to take the wrong view on any subject, is in agreement with the views I express. Are you quite sure of everything you say? Absolutely, Prime Minister. I might add that the patience of the industrial constituencies is much shorter than that of London, and that the opinion of the Commonwealth is likely to coincide with that of the provinces. Matt, so, there's uh, some time before the next cabinet meeting, but it's now virtually established that all ministers will support the prime minister, as will Attlee and the opposition, by a few exceptions, who seek uh, personal advertisement. And what of Churchill? Churchill... <laughs> Churchill will want the king treated with as much kindness and respect as possible. Uh, but in the end, he supports Baldwin. Mm. An undivided parliamentary front. Max, the Prime Minister hopes that uh, when the story breaks... As break, it soon must. The press will also present an undivided front. Hmm. I cannot speak for others any longer. I fancy things have gone too far for that. But for myself, Sam, I have taken the king's shilling. So therefore, I am the king's man. Yes, David, the car has just arrived. How like you to think of that when you have so many other worries. Well, yes, Crew 27 will solve some of the problems, would it could take care of them all. David, what's happening? Oh, I see. Of course I understand. But you will let me know if there's anything new, just as soon as you can. Remember who is the king. Just the usual supply of champagne. Oh, the king's servant was downright disobliging. I asked him to carry the wine down to the basement for me, but he pretended not to hear and left it in the hall. Well, I expect morale is rather low in his household just now. Uh, this letter for you was just dropped into the box. Well, thank you, Aunt Bessie. Wallace. I must call David. Oh, oh, my dear, how, how dare they? Yes. Yes, of course, Mrs. Simpson. Yes, Wallace, what is it? David, 
the most frightening thing has just happened. And, and Bessie and I re received um, an anonymous letter threatening us, and we're all alone here. Yes, honest, of course I understand. Please try and stay calm. You mustn't let it upset you like this. It's not like you. Well, now, yes, well, I think the best thing would be for you to come down and stay at the fort. Well, you'll be quite safe there, and I can look after you. Now, Wallace, you leave everything to me, and please don't worry. cabinet decision was as I feared. Except for Duff Cooper, a unanimous rejection of the Morganatic proposal. And the cables to the Dominions were framed in the same rigid way as Baldwin had presented the case to the cabinet. Well, how do you hear this? Over lunch with a member of the cabinet. Sir, you have placed your head on the execution block. All that Baldwin has to do now is swing the axe. Hmm. I'm expecting the execution at 6 o'clock this evening. Don't worry, sir. I'm, I'm sure we'll find some solution. We mustn't lose sight of your popular support. Have you, uh, have you seen the cables to the Dominions? No, not yet. Well, they've been slanted to bring them behind Baldwin. I was hoping to hear the replies very soon. Have you seen the papers? Yes. I must warn you, sir, that this will get worse. There will be sensational disclosures in a London morning paper. So it's about to break. Oh. Well, I'd like to spare yeah, Wallace that. Be prepared, sir, for a virulent attack on you in the Times. I beg you, sir, please lift the restrictions on those papers friendly to you. No. Very kind of you, but I do not wish to divide the nation. Well, the criticism in the provincial papers is all rather discreet, Aunt Bessie. I'm not even mentioned by name. All has rather to do with the king's self-dedication. However, they are drawing all sorts of ridiculous parallels. One reporter even sees a portent in the destruction of the Crystal Palace. Typical superstitious English. <laughs> Well, the king will do what he can to silence the London papers. Remember, your interests are foremost in his mind. Yes, and, and he has got powerful friends. And they're working on his behalf. And yours, Wallace, honey. Come in. Do sit down. Thank you, sir. I have some of the replies from the Dominion, sir. At last. Knowing how anxious you are, I brought them with me. Good. Well, what do they say? Although they are not yet complete, they do show that a morganatic marriage would not be accepted. Who would not accept it? Here are the cables, sir. Australia, His Majesty could not now re-establish his prestige. Oh, command confidence as king. Well, that's Australia. Savage of New Zealand says he will not quarrel with anything the king does, nor with anything his government do to restrain him. He's rather hedging his bets, isn't he? It's only fair to Savage, sir, to say that he had never heard of Mrs. Simpson before he had the cable. Yes, New Zealand is a very distant country, Prime Minister. Well, what about the other dominions? India is divided, Canada and South Africa definitely against. What about Parliament? The answer, I'm sure, would be the same. But it is yet to say as much. I have put inquiries in hand, sir. I am convinced that neither Parliament nor the people would approve of your marrying Mrs. Simpson. Then let Parliament and the people say so for themselves. They'll say so soon enough, sir, if you force them to it. Our hope is that you will enable them to remain silent by giving up any idea of this marriage. That is the first of three courses open to you, sir, and the one I pray you will take. And the other courses? 
Secondly, you may marry and abdicate. And thirdly? You could marry against the advice of your ministers, in which case, sir... Uh, in which case, Mr. Baldwin? I should resign if you persisted, and no one would be prepared to form a new government. There would have to be a general election on the issue of your marriage. Your name would be hawked around the polling booths, degrading for you, sir, and a disaster for your kingdom. So please believe me, sir, if you marry Mrs. Simpson, you will have to go. But we all hope, please believe me, sir, that you will stay. Well, since my whole happiness depends on our marrying, I have no choice then but to abdicate, Mr. Baldwin. Your happiness, sir, could surely be found elsewhere in serving and reigning over your people, in fulfilling your responsibilities and your duties to your country. Only I know where my happiness lies. But you must know where it should lie. Wallace is the most wonderful woman in the world. Well, sir, I hope that you may find her so. And whatever happens, I hope that you will be happy. Thank you. Anyway, they don't want me anymore. We do want you, sir. But we wouldn't think so to read all this. And tomorrow there'll be more of it. And worse. We must protect Mrs. Simpson against all this. We must forbid Dawson of the Times to publish anything against her. I cannot forbid Dawson, sir. In England, the press, like every man's speech, is free. But Dawson must be stopped. Would you speak to him for me? I can promise nothing, sir, but I will talk to him. Thank you. I'm so sorry, ma'am. Thank you, my dear. That will be all for now. Darling. May I see the paper? There was none on my tray this morning. Let's see what they have to say today. Well, I thought, we thought, oh, that is the king. Where's David? Oh, don't upset yourself, Wallace, dear. But this is dreadful. This is simply dreadful. Wallace, Wallace, dear. David? 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 David, have you seen the papers? Have you read what they're saying about us? Yes. Now, Wallace, please don't let this upset you. But it, it's, 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 it's so dreadful. It's, it's so cheap and degrading. It's so cruel. I did what I could to stop them. I, I, I don't understand. What do they want from me? They've driven me from my home. I'm hounded wherever I go, and now my name is a dirty household word. David, why didn't you tell me it was going to be like this? Darling, I'd no idea they'd be so vile. Oh, Wallace, wouldn't it be better if you went away for a while? Went away? Well, I when... mean, if you went abroad. You are my first concern, and I'm terribly worried about the effect that this is having on you. Now, please, wouldn't that be the answer? I don't know anything anymore, David. Well, I do. And I won't have you exposed to this. Any more. Now you must go abroad, and the sooner the better. And I shall handle everything. Now you leave it to me. Come in. Do sit down, won't you? It's very nice of you to come at such short notice, Benny. These bloody newspapers are much worse than I feared. The press hounds just won't let up on us. Do sit down, won't you? 
It's an ugly business, sir. Yes, sir, it's getting uglier. Which is why I've asked you to come this evening, Harry. Could you drop everything and escort Wallace to France for me? It will be an honor, sir, to do anything in my power to help. Thank you very much. Now, Wallace and I have discussed it all, and we think that it's best that she go to stay with the Herman Rogers at their villa in Cannes. You know them, I believe. Yes, sir. When would we go? As soon as possible. Tonight. Short notice, I know. But... And that's all right, sir. Will we fly? No, by car. Of course, it'd be quicker to fly. Solve a lot of other problems, too, but Wallace is very nervous of flying, and particularly just this moment. That's understandable, sir. Now, I've arranged for Ladbrook to drive. And you'll be accompanied by Evans, my detective. It'll be just the four of you. And I know you'll look after it for me. That goes without saying, sir. Shall I book the passage on the night steamer? No, it's already been done, under assumed names. I hate all this cloak and dagger stuff, but obviously Wallace's identity has to be protected from the press. It's awfully good of you, Penny. You must think about my idea of broadcasting to your people. I will. I'll work on it, I promise. By President Roosevelt's chats. Just cut through the red tape and appeal directly. Yes, now, Wallace, we haven't got very long. We must accept Perry's protection as if it were my own. When will I see you again? Well, I can't say, but it won't be very long. But you must stay in camp. And you must telephone me every day. You'll telephone as well? Of course. Every day? Every day. being without you. Now there's the draft of my broadcast. And that is what I wish to tell my people. I shall consult my colleagues, sir. Uh... But I have no doubt what their opinion will be. For you to appeal directly to the country over the heads of the government would be unconstitutional. You want me to go, don't you? But before I do, I think it is right, for her sake, as well as for mine, that I should speak. What I want, sir, is what you told me you wanted. To go with dignity, not dividing the country and making things as smooth as possible for your successor. If you are allowed to make this broadcast, you will be telling millions throughout the world, among them a vast number of women, that you are determined to marry one who has two husbands living. The thing would make chaos everywhere. But I would ask you at least to consult your colleagues. Yes, sir. I can do that. All I'm asking for is that I should be allowed to marry whom I choose. She needn't be the queen. Just have a title befitting to my wife. And I could tell the nation all this on the wireless. And then go away somewhere. The Belgium, perhaps. While well, the people came to their verdict. David, ask the people. Broadcast in person to your subjects. Make them let you speak. Hello? Hello? Do you hear me? Do you understand? David, I, I have to go now. The press are at her heels. Goodbye. I'll call you again as soon as I can. You must not abdicate. We have to get 
gets away with us. The courtyard is crowded with photographers. Well, it was so difficult we could hardly hear each other speak. Well, we'll try and shake them off and then you can call again. Mm -hmm. now, now, stay close to me. We'll make a dash for the car. <laughs> this, David. And you haven't been to see me for ten days. But I didn't wish to involve you in something which I must handle alone. Whatever is to happen, it closely concerns your brothers, particularly Bertie. I told Bertie soon after I first told you. But since then, nothing. I wish to spare him distress as well as you. You must consult with Bertie, David. He has a right to know what is going on. Well, I wish I knew myself. That's all I have to say. Do your duty, at least in this. Consult the brother who is to succeed you when you go. Good night, Mama. Will you be happy, David? When you leave your own country, where will you go? Good heavens, you've been waiting, Walter. That's quite all right, sir. Well, that was very kind of you, sir. I'm seeing my mother. I'm afraid I bring little comfort, sir. I've shown your draft to Winston. He says it's useless. The cabinet will regard it as unconstitutional if you go to the people over the heads of your ministers, and they'll never let you broadcast it. I see. You think that's final? Yes, sir, I do. Like a drink, Walter? Um, not at the moment, thank you, sir. down to the fort. At this time of night, sir? Yes. Well, then, I hope you'll let me come with you, sir. Might be rather poor company, but thank you, yes. I'd be very glad of yours. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. May I ask the Prime Minister a question of which I've given private notice, whether he is now in a position to make a statement on the constitutional position. Mr. Speaker, I regret to say that at this moment I have nothing to add to what I said yesterday. Mr. Churchill. Mr. Speaker, may I repeat the question which I asked yesterday and ask my right honorable friend whether he can give an assurance that no irrevocable step will be taken before a statement is made to the House. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I have nothing to add now to what I said yesterday. Mr. Speaker, I should like to ask the Prime Minister whether he has anything to add to the answer he gave to the question I put to him at the beginning of today's proceedings. Mr. Speaker, yes, sir, in view of the widely circulated suggestions as to certain possibilities in the event of the King's marriage, I think it would be advisable for me to make a statement. Suggestions have appeared in certain organs of the press yesterday and again today that should the king decide to marry, his wife need not become queen. Such ideas are without any constitutional foundation. There is no such thing as what is called a morganatic marriage known to our law. The king himself requires no consent from any authority in order to make his marriage legal. But, as I have said, the lady whom he marries, by the fact of her marrying the king, necessarily becomes queen. And she herself, therefore, enjoys all the status and privileges which, by positive law and by custom, attach to that position. The only possible way in which this result could be avoided would be by legislation to deal with a particular case. His Majesty's government are not prepared to introduce such legislation. Yeah. 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 Moreover, the matters to be dealt with are of common concern to the Commonwealth as well, and such a change could only be effected with the assent of all the Dominions. I am yeah. satisfied yeah. from inquiries that I have made that no such assent would be forthcoming. I have thought it right to make this statement before the House adjourned today in order to remove a widespread misunderstanding. At the moment, I have no other statement to make. Mr. Atty. Mr. Speaker, at this stage, I think it would be, even if time allowed, undesirable to make any comment or to discuss the Prime Minister's statement. It is one to which we shall all have to give our very gravest consideration. Yeah. 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 Sir, the Cabinet cannot permit Your Majesty to broadcast to the nation in the manner you suggest. It now only remains for Your Majesty to decide if you do intend to abdicate to marry Mrs. Simpson. There is still time for you to change your mind, sir. And that is indeed the prayer of your majesty's servants. I will let you know as soon as possible. I heard rumors saying that the demonstration starting in the mall. Yes, that's perfectly true. There are people gathering outside the palace. These are people who want you to stay and Baldwin to go. Yes, but Winston, I doubt they represent the majority opinion. We shall see. Uh, even so, sir, there's a good deal of support for you and a desire in many quarters to have you stay at all costs. I quite agree with you, Walter. Four nights ago, when I addressed the Albert Hall rally, attacking the government's failure to rearm, it was impossible not to be inspired by the fervour with which those assembled sang, God save the King. Very heartening to hear all this. With that part of my speech, relative to your Majesty, that I was stopped from making at the rally, I have now issued to the press. Essentially, it is a plea for time and patience. <laughs> Not unreasonable, of course. But I hope you have more success than I did, Winston. <laughs> Although you cannot speak, sir, others are speaking for you. The Daily Mirror is publishing articles favorable to you, Mrs. Simpson. Well, I'm very pleased for Wallace's sake. He's been most miserably treated in all this. Even so, sir, the national press is divided. The Times, The Telegraph, and The Manchester Garden, the three most influential newspapers, all support Mr. Baldwin, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Mail and The Express are on your side. And The News Chronicle. That's just pretty surprising, isn't it? Uh, for a non-conformist newspaper, I agree, sir. <laughs> Excuse me, Your Majesty. The Duke of York is on the telephone. His Royal Highness is very anxious to speak with you. Oh, yes. Well, I shall let him know when to come to see me. Yes, Your Majesty. Uh, 
What were we saying, Walter? That the News Chronicle sports you, sir. They love you well enough to overlook their more uh, pious principles. <laughs> Take time, sir. I cannot say that you will win through, but at least you can assess the measure of support you receive. We must have time for the big battalions to mass. We may win, we may not. Who can say? But whatever happens, Winston, I am going to marry Wallace. <laughs>